you. And um, I'm really happy to be part of this series of, of seminar. And I would like to thank the IGS for giving me the opportunity to present my work. So I'm going to present the work that I've been do doing during the last two years of postdoc at IG. And so we are going to talk about ice velocity and thickness mapping of the world's uh, glaciers. Okay. So first, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people uh, that I've been working with at IG and uh, in the US, uh, without whom this work would not have been possible. Um, I also would like to thank uh, the French Space Agency for funding uh, these two years of postdocs and, um, and also the uh, National Research, A Research Agency of France that funded the SOS ICE project. Okay, so we all know that the ice thickness is a fundamental variable in glaciology. It allows to quantify the amount of fre fresh water that is stored in glaciers. And uh, of course, it's uh, fundamental variables uh, uh, to use as an input in, in glacier model to predict the future contribution of glaciers to sea level rise. So, However, measuring the ice thickness has always been a challenge. So the most used technique is the ground or airborne penetrating radar. But for temperate glaciers, it's, it's, a, challenge, it's a challenge to use it because water content uh, within the ice and when there is a lot of precipitation uh, that hamper the radar signal from reaching the bottom of the, of the ice. So here you have a, a, an example of uh, a radar profile, airborne ra radar profile on the Grunifern Glacier in the Alps. And you can see that where the glacier is the thickest, uh, we are not able to, to map the, the bedrock. There is also some other uh, techniques, uh, geophysical techniques, that uses the inversion of gravimetry. Uh, you have here an example of thickness map obtained from uh, gravimetry inversion in Patagonia. So this is a paper we published in 2019. But there is a limit in resolution of this technique, uh, which uh, emper our ability to apply it to small glacier. And also campaigns are difficult to apply to globally because they are quite costly. So while data have been acquired from various scientific team around the world, there has been uh, an international initiative that really facilitated the life of uh, glaciologists. Uh, this initiative is the, is the Glacier Thickness Database. So um, it's uh, an inventory of all available in situ ice thickness measurements of glaciers around the world. So on this map, you can see in blue the contours of, the gla of uh, mountain glaciers. And um, in uh, green, you have points where we have uh, uh, ice thickness measurements. So you, what is striking is that still there is some areas, highly glacierized areas that have not been measured yet. Uh, the most striking example is the Himalayan range and the Russian Arctic where no data are publicly available yet. So in response to this lack of data, there has been an increasing development of inversion approaches to calculate ice thicknesses at the scale of entire glaciers, which was crucial if we wanted to model properly their future evolution. So method, uh, the methods started with simple approaches, such as uh, area uh, volume scaling, you have here an example of this relationship uh, from the Barretal 97 paper. And some other approaches, uh, for example, use uh, the shear stress approach, which only needs a DEM as an input. So um, these techniques have rapidly evolved into more complex approaches that uses, for example, uh, mass conservation. Uh, you have here an example of a thickness inversion of the Rhone Glacier in the Alps by uh, Daniel Farinotti. You also have methods that use uh, the inversion of ice uh, flow velocity. You have here two examples uh, in the Alps again and in the Himalayas from Rabatel and Gantaya. And uh, you even have even more complex um, methodology that uses a neural network and Bayesian inversion that have been developed. 
So as a result of this large variety of technique, there was a major breakthrough in 2019 uh, with the first uh, multimodal and global uh, ice thickness maps that were published. So this, this paper uh, has combined um, five different inversion approach and provide thickness maps of all glaciers on Earth. So, however, the models that are used in, in this consensus have some limitation, mainly due to the use of flow line approaches. So the, the flow line approaches may be suitable for valley glaciers. You have here an example on the Karakoram range uh, on the left. But when you, you, you reach the ice cap at the poles, uh, the, this, th those approaches can create uh, several artifacts. You have here an example of an ice thickness map of the Barn ice cap in Baffin Island, uh, <coughs> where you can see the, the thickness that are close to zero at the boundary of the glacial basins. And you can see this, this steep transition right in the middle of the ice cap, which are direct consequences of the, this flow line approach. Another major initiative that is important to mention is the Ice Thickness Intercomparison Project that was published in 2017 and led by uh, Daniel Farinotti. So this project aims at comparing uh, different inversion techniques in order to have an, ass an assessment on the level of uncertainty that we have uh, on the ice thicknesses. So you can see at the bottom uh, three different glaciers uh, all the colored line represent the different models that were used to calculate the thickness. So one of the important conclusion from this paper was that the thickness models can differ considerably and uh, they, the spread by which they differ uh, is comparable to the actual observed thickness. The, the second really interesting um, the conclusion of this paper was that also the models that relies on multiple data sets are highly sensitive to the quality of the input data. So what do we need to calculate ice thicknesses? So we need a digital elevation model. There has been a, a lot of progress with this. Even though we don't have precisely time tag DEM, we, we have a global coverage, uh, for example, with the Tandemix DEM, the Aster DEM. Um, we also need surface mass balance. Uh, this is a challenging, uh, a challenging one, uh, specifically uh, getting high resolution surface mass balance for a mountain glacier is, is particularly uh, difficult. We need uh, elevation change. So this was also um, difficult to get, but recently with the publication of the Hugo Neital 2021 uh, paper, we, we have uh, uh, really a, an amazing coverage of uh, surface elevation change uh, with uh, surface elevation change spanning the years from 2000 to present. As I said, we also need in situ, of course, high thicknesses. Uh, so some regions uh, uh, desperately need some of this. And finally, the, the data I will be interested in this uh, presentation is the ice velocity. So by definition, the ice velocity uh, gives uh, a crucial information on the distribution of the ice thicknesses uh, across a glacier. But uh, due to the lack of measurement with sufficient resolution or quality, this data have not been uh, widely used in ice thickness inversion. You have here a, a coverage map of the It's Live uh, data, uh, data set. And you can see that there is still some big regions that are missing. For example, the, the glaciers in the Andes, the Alps, uh, Caucasus, and, uh, and New Zealand. Also, something uh, that we should note is that those data are provided at a sampling resolution of 120 to 250 meters, which can be a, a limitation when you are looking at some small valley glacier uh, like the one you can find in the Andes. So the goal of this project is to provide a new global coverage of glacier surface flow velocity at a resolution that is sufficient for glacier modeling and, to, um, and also for the study of the ice dynamics. 
And the second goal is to use this new product to, pro to provide a new estimation of glo global ice volume uh, based on the ice velocity inversion. So at IGE, we developed a new uh, automatic processing chain that has the capacity to calculate ice velocity at the scale of entire mountain range. So this pipeline was developed for the latest generation of satellite images. So we use optical data from Sentinel-2, Landsat-8, and locally, we also have some higher resolution uh, sensor. We have the French-Israeli satellite from Venus, which requires data at five meter resolution. And we have the Play Playad imagery, which requires data at a resolution of 50 centimeters. For glaciers where um, we don't have enough uh, features to track the ice flow uh, in optical images, we also use some uh, radar data. So typically it's gonna be uh, at the poles or where we have large uh, ice caps or ice field. Uh, so we use the, the also we combine the optical and the radar data. So we process that data uh, when we started the project for the years 2017, 2018. And so, so the pipeline is decomposed into three main modules. We have the first one, uh, where, which is the image preparation one. So we, we are going to form all possible image pairs with a uh, time interval ranging from the nominal sensor cycle up to more than a year. So for opti optical data, we also filter, filter our images with a Sobol filter uh, in order to enhance surface features. And uh, the second module is the, the ice displacement module. So we use the cross-correlation algorithm that was initially in the Roy Pack SAR processing chain. Uh, so this algorithm was called MCore. So we kept the core of the algorithm and wrapped it up in a Python uh, package in order to have more flexibility uh, with the cross-correlation. So when the ice displacement are cal calculated, we convert the ice displacement into ice velocity. So this is the third module. And we calibrate each pair. So for the calibration, uh, we uh, mask glacierized area. And we calculate a linear ramp for Landsat 8, a quadratic function, function for Sentinel-1, and a constant value for Sentinel-2 to best fit the displacement on stable ground. So we do this in the east-west and north-south components independently. And we finally remove this fit from the entire displacement map to obtain uh, ice velocity that is centered on zero on stable ground. So, for, uh, so at the end of this three module, we have two main products. We have a multi-temporal product. And from this multi-temporal product, we calculate a composite mosaic. So for each region, we calculate composite velocity mosaic for each sensor. And we use a weighted average that depends on the, on the sensor resolution, on the repeat cycle. And, and uh, we manually attribute uh, the, so yeah, so yeah, the, for each repeat cycle. Uh, after, after this, we combine uh, all different sensors and so we attribute the weight on the sensor manually by checking which mosaic has the best coverage. And finally, we do, we do some, uh, we remove outliers using a median filtering and we smooth the data using a Gaussian smoothing uh, algorithm. So the size of the kernels for the median and the Gaussian smoothing are determined uh, with the, with the, uh, depending on the distance from the glacier margin so that you have a uh, uh, no filtering close to the margin and a uh, strong uh, filtering when you are in the middle of an ice cap. On this map, you can see all the regions that were covered. So all regions uh, in yellow have sensor Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8. Uh, regions in, in green also have some high resolution optical data and the region in blue are covered with uh, Sentinel-2, Landsat-8 and Sentinel-1. So uh, uh, we, overall, we processed uh, uh, over 800,000 pairs of images. So this massive processing was only possible with the use of the computer uh, facility at the University of Grenoble, which is called the GRICAD. Oh, 
And uh, here in this slide, I want to illustrate the high value of using uh, radar data in polar regions. So here you have a composite velocity mosaic for the Penny ice cap in Baffin Island. So you have the Sentinel-2 uh, on the left, Landsat-8 in the middle, and Sentinel-1 on the right. So you can see that in this case, um, neither Sentinel-2 or Landsat-8 are, um, uh, uh, neither of these sensors uh, capture the, the pattern of, of the flow in the interior of the ice cap. The only sensor that, um, that uh, captured this is Sentinel-1, where you can see this, uh, these ice streams that uh, extend up in the middle of the, um, of the ice cap. So now, how are these ice flow measurements precise? So here we calculate the precision of each repeat cycle after masking out uh, gl the glaciers. So, so we then calculate the standard deviations uh, on stable ground. And this is what we, we use as a measure of the precision. So what, what you can see here on the upper right is, the, is this measure of precision with respect to the, to the time interval between the, the two the image pairs. So what you can see is that for the nominal repeat cycle of Sentinel, uh, of Sentinel-2, so five days, we have uh, a precision of 40 meters per year. For Landsat-8, at 16 days, we have a precision of 30 meters per year. And this rapidly decreased up to more than, um, when, we, when we use repeat cycle of more than a year, we have a precision that is uh, about one meter per year. What we can see here is that uh, Landsat-8, uh, Sentinel-2 is on average twice more precise than Landsat-8. So this gives you a, a proxy on the cycle that you should use if you want to study the, the ice, ice variation in ice dynamics. So I didn't write it here, but for Sentinel-1, um, for a repeat cycle of uh, six days, uh, we, we, we have a precision of about uh, 20 meters per year. When you are uh, doing, uh, using Sentinel-1 over uh, ice cap, we expect the precision to be much less precise when you are in mountain areas where you have way more uh, distortions. Okay, so here at the bottom, you have an example of time series of ice velocity on the Fox Glacier in New Zealand, where you can clearly see the, the, the seasonal pattern that is captured by, by, um, by all sensors. So this was just to illustrate uh, the, the capacity of Sentinel-2 uh, and Landsat-8 to capture the, the, the seasonal variations. So to quantify the, the accuracy of the measurements, we use GPS ground measurements uh, in the Alps that were, um, that were uh, acquired through the Glacial Clim Observatory at uh, IGE. And we also use GPS network uh, in the Austrian Alps from Stoker et al. So when we compare the, the GPS to the, um, to the composite velocity map of 2017-2018, we have an average difference of six meters per year. So on this slide, you have a comparison of the actual its life coverage in red and uh, the coverage from our study in yellow. So I just want here to show uh, the improvement in world coverage. So we, we really covered all the small Andean glaciers uh, in South America, uh, in Europe, and in New Zealand, and also all the uh, subantarctic islands. Also, the, the ice velocity map that we will provide, uh, there will be at a sampling resolution of 50 meters, which is two to three times uh, better than what, what, what was done before, and which can have a great influence if you look at small, small scale, small features in ice velocity. Locally, uh, I want to show on this slide some of the improvements that can be observed when you compare uh, this new uh, product with what exists uh, at the moment. So um, on the top left, you have the uh, composite velocity map from its life over Penguin Glacier in Patagonia that flows at more than 12 uh, kilometers per year. And on the right, you have the composite map from uh, this study. So you can see here uh, the high value of combining three different sensors 
uh, including radar data, which really allows to capture this uh, the, the complete pattern of ice flow, uh, which was not uh, present in previous mapping. At the bottom, you have another example over smaller glaciers in the Himalayas, uh, close to the Everest region. You have the Kumbu Glacier here, and the, this famous ice fall there, which is quite narrow. And here you can really see the benefit of using a, a smaller sampling resolution in the cross correlation, where we are completely able to, to capture the, the full uh, increase in ice velocity over this ice fall. So now let's take a little tour uh, around, the, uh, around the world of the composite map that we calculated. So I'm starting here with some glaciers uh, in the Cordillera Blanca in the Andes. So you have the, the Remondi glaciers, uh, one, two, three, that are flowing on really steep slopes. So those are really small glaciers, not uh, only a few kilometers long, uh, flowing on steep slope at more than 300 meters per year. So really impressive uh, glacial features. Uh, here you have the Mont Blanc on the Italian side. So the Mont Blanc summit is here. And here you have the, the Miage Glacier, which is a, a debris covered glacier with uh, three um, uh, narrow tributaries that flow on the Miage Glacier at, at speed of more than 300 meters per year. And here you have some, some glaciers in, in the Kamchatka regions. So the Ushkovsky uh, mountain range with this really um, amazing ice tongue of more than eight ki kilometers long that is really narrow flowing down of this uh, volcano. This is a composite mosaic of the Cordillera Darwin in Chile. So we are really proud of, of this, the coverage of this region because it's a really challenging one that is most of the time covered in clouds. So you can see that the composite map is not perfect. Uh, we have some holes here that, that you can see, but still we, again, combining the, the different sensor helped us to have the, the most complete uh, mosaic that we, could, that we could assemble. Here we, we make a, a step up in terms of, of scales. So you have uh, the Alaskan glaciers, so um, Barnard Glacier and Chitina Glacier here. So we're really an amazing network of uh, tributaries. We, we, you have all kinds of glaciers, small, small valley glacier and this large, large uh, ice, ice flow that, uh, features that can be observed. And finally here we have the Patagonian ice field. So the Southern Patagonian ice field with Viedma, Uppsala, and Pio 11 glacier. Uh, we are also really proud of this new map because it's also a really challenging region. It's really difficult actually to cover the interior of the, of the ice field. Uh, there is not many studies that have succeeded in doing this. And here really the, the key, I repeated it, I repeated, but is to combine radar data and um, optical data and really uh, use a, a, a really fine post-processing to combine these different data set. Okay, so now I'm gonna move to the ice thickness calculation part. So now the goal is to use this uh, new ice velocity product to calculate ice, the ice thickness distribution of all glaciers on Earth. So we use a simple approach that is based on the shallow ice approximation, which connect the thickness here to the surface velocity and the, and the surface slope. So we, we take a, a n exponent of equal to three. Uh, we have the a, the creep parameter, that, uh, which I'm going to talk about more later, and uh, the slope here. So if we solve for h, we have these equations at the bottom. And so here we don't use uh, a glacier by, gla by glacier approach as it was classically used uh, in the consensus estimate, but we invert the velocity regionally to directly get, get a regional uh, ice thickness map. So the first step is to calculate uh, surface slope. 
So to do this, we combine three different D DM sources. We combine the Aster uh, version three, a global DM, the Tendemix DM, and in the Arctic, we use the WorldView Arctic DM that was obtained from digital globe imagery. So we combine uh, in Valley Glacier, we combine the Aster and the Tendemix DM using the DM roughness. So basically we, we combine the DM so that we have the a, a combined DM with the lowest uh, roughness. And then we calculate the slope. And finally, we also filter the surface slope uh, and smooth it using a, a Gaussian kernel uh, with, with no smoothing when you are within 150 meters from the ice margin and the smoothing that increases when you, you move away from the, the ice margin. So you have an example here on the glaciers in Spitzberg with on the left the unsmoothed surface slope and on the right you have the, the result of, of the smoothing. So we, with this, we really uh, uh, preserve small, small scale, uh, uh, tri sm small tributaries, small glacial tributaries. So after calculating the surface slope, one of the most important steps is to calculate this creep parameter. So to do this, we use um, in situ ice thickness data from the glacier thickness database. Uh, so we solve uh, the equation for A. Uh, as you can see here, and uh, H is now the in-situ ice thickness data. So we, as I said, uh, we, um, the Himalayan range is missing a lot of data. So we specifically, specifically on the, uh, on the main arc. So we also uh, got some data from the Glacier Klim Observatory and from other uh, radar campaign that allows us to have few measurements on, on three different glaciers along the arc that helped a little bit in calculating this creep parameter. So once we have all, the, all this data, we divide our regions into small boxes, uh, as you can see here, uh, that are uh, defined depending on the, on the in-situ data that are available. And inside these boxes, we calculate an average A, and we do the, the inversion over the, the, the entire boxes. Other in situ thickness data that we used are the data from uh, that I mentioned earlier that were obtained from the inversion of gravimetry and uh, radar data. So you have the gravimetry here on the left and uh, the radar data on the right. So those data are available at NSIDC if anyone is interested. Finally, we have, uh, after we calculated the A, we are still left with this beta parameter. Be this beta parameter gives the, the amount of internal deformation that causes the difference between the surface velocity and the basal velocity. So actually, we, we have strong limitation when the sliding becomes dominant with the shallow ice approximation. And specifically, uh, we overestimate uh, the ice thickness when the surface velocity is several order of magnitude larger than the slope, or when the slope is really small, uh, which means that the glacial surface is nearly flat. So to try to mitigate this effect, we calculate an, uh, empirically uh, this beta parameter using uh, the ratio between the surface velocity and the slope of the glacier. This is what you can see on this map in red. So using an upper and lower threshold of this parameter, we are able to assemble a map of, of, of the, what, what I will call the sliding parameter, which allows us to make this, the value vary from a zero sliding in the center of an ice cap, and which gradually uh, increases to one, which means that sliding becomes more dominant. So our ice thickness model were validated over the European Alps because it has been uh, extensively covered with uh, in situ thicknesses. So what we did basically is that we removed 60% of the in situ data uh, before uh, doing the calibration. We calculate the ice thickness with the 40% of the data that are remaining, and we compare the results with the data that were removed. So on this scatter plot, you can see the model thickness 
uh, versus the, the glacial thickness database thicknesses. So we have a uh, an average difference of minus 16 meters and a standard deviation of 50 meters. Uh, we also calculated this uh, standard deviation uh, with uh, respect to thickness bins. This is what you can see on the right. And what we found is that on average, our th ice thickness inversions have uncertainties of 25%. Uh, because glacial surges can significantly impact uh, the result of our ice thickness, we need to account for them in the error budget. So we calculated that if uh, the ice velocity increases by a factor of 10, uh, it will change the ice thickness by 75%. So we decided to uh, increase the uncertainty for a glacier that were experiencing surge from 25 to 75%. To, so we made an inventory of glacier, glacier surges uh, using the specific observed uh, elevation change uh, that, that you have when, when a glacier experiences a surge, where we have a surface uh, surface uplift uh, in the lower part of the glacier and a surface lower, lowering um, in, the, in the accumulation area. So we use the uh, DHDT maps from Ugone uh, 2021. Uh, uh, specifically, we use the period 2015-2019, which includes our 2017-2018 study period. And so we counted a number of 98 surge which re represent 2% uh, of the RGI uh, area and 2% uh, of the RGI volume. So on this slide, you have the volume of all RGI regions with on the right column, the regional difference with the consensus estimate. So in total, uh, we have a difference, we have a volume that is 10% lower to pre previous estimate, but with the, some difference can, can, can be larger regionally, specifically for Asia here and uh, glaciers in the low latitudes. I will come back to these two cases a little bit later. So now, um, before translating this volume in sea level equivalent, we need uh, to make sure that glaciers are not accounted both in the ice sheet volume and in, uh, in the glacier volume. So for Greenland, previous studies um, remove glaciers that have a degree of connection greater than two, as defined by the Randolph Glacier Inventory. But there is no uh, information on the level of connection in Antarctica. So we attributed this level of connection, following the, the example of Greenland, to uh, glaciers in Antarctica. And we removed uh, 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 all the glaciers that, are, that, that were connected to the, to the ice sheet. So here you have an example in West Antarctica. So you can see on the right, the initial Randolph inventory and on the left, sorry, and on the right, the, the inventory after glaciers were removed. So when you translate the, the total volume into sea level equivalent, and so you, you correct for the ice, that is located below sea level. If you account for uh, glaciers connected to Antarctica, we have a volume that is 4% lower than uh, the consensus estimate. And when we remove the, the connection to Antarctica, we have uh, a lower sea level equivalent uh, at, of uh, 25 centimeters, that is 20% lower than uh, the consensus. But as I said, this relatively close match does not highlight regional and local difference that can be larger. And this is what I'm going to present now. So what you can see here on the, on the left is the ice thickness, thickness map from the flow, ice flow inversion. And on the right, it's the thickness map from the consensus estimate. So light blue colors indicate thin ice and dark blue indicates uh, thick ice. So I like this example because you can really see the value of using ice velocity along with slope as an input of the inversion. On the left, we can really distinguish this deep glacial trough that reaches the interior of the ice cap, a feature that is not very clear in the, in the consensus estimate. It is also worth noting that for outlet valley glaciers, 
the the thickness reconstruction for the, the two the two cases are quite similar. Here you have a, a thickness map of the Vatnajökull ice cap in Iceland. Uh, so you have on the right uh, again the consensus, and here you can really see the limitation of using flow line models with again this uh, step steep uh, boundaries with almost zero thicknesses at the at the glacial divide and also we have this strong lateral uh, interpolation artifact which are direct result of the flow line approach so here we have a, a ice thickness map that is not perfect you can see that there is some uh, noise that remains but still it's we have something that is consistent especially uh, yes so here you have another example on the russian arctic so this is the same ID uh, that I just explained before. So now does this result have a direct impact on the freshwater availability for Valley Glacier? So in this figure, you have two maps. In the north, you have a map of the Himalayan range. And in the south, you have a map of the Southern Cordilleras of South America. So on each map, we plotted watershed basins where glacier contribution to runoff is greater than 5%. So we use this from the papers of Lutz and Soruko. So inside these basins, you have uh, the population density in color, varying from white to dark red, where uh, the population, where you have a densely populated area. And then you have the circles. So the circles have three informations in it. Uh, first, the size of the circle is proportional to the number of people within a basin. The color of the circle represents the water resources stored in glaciers per people per year. And the percentage inside the circle is the difference uh, with the consensus estimate and our data set. So here the takeaway information is that at the basin scale, we, have, we can have large differences in water resources estimations. In the case of the Himalayas, we have a larger ice volume, which reduces uh, uh, hypothetically the pressure on water resources for, for people living in those basins. And on the contrary, in the Cordillera Real, where glaciers are small and the population is densely populated, for example, in the La Paz basins, we have a reduced amount of fre fresh water available for people, which is likely to increase the pressure uh, on water resources. Okay, so some conclusions and perspectives. So, just a summary, so I just presented a new ice velocity product of all glaciers on Earth for the years 2017-2018. We provide the data at a sampling resolution of 50 meters and covers all types of glaciers going from small Andean glaciers up to uh, fast marine, marine terminating glaciers and ice caps. So of course this data set is complementary with existing product from its life, for example, because our uh, data only covers tw two years and we are working on extending this data set so we now have a, a ESA project glacier science uh, in the Alps so we along with this ice velocity we provide inversion of the ice flow so we provide ice thickness estimation of all glaciers on earth which is an alternative to global product uh, uh, with the inversion that is based on the regional approach. So we have observed large differences in uh, uh, thickness distribution and specifically locally for uh, glaciers at the pole. Something that is worth keeping in mind is that uh, the thickness inversion is uh, uh, strongly sensitive to the in situ uh, uh, thickness data because those are used to, to calculate the, the creep parameter. So there is still some progress needed to share uh, data through, through public uh, portal, such as the Glacier Thickness Database or NSIDC. We have regions, again, that are lacking a lot of this data. Again, the Russian Arctic and the, the Himalayas are the most striking examples. 
So finally, we have entered a, a new era of observation with the release of global data sets. So we have this, this, this new DHDT data set from Romain Gonet, now uh, ice thickness and ice velocities for all glaciers on Earth. So with this study, we have shown that on, using only two years of data allows us to do a comprehensive mapping of uh, all, the, all the glaciers on Earth, which uh, 20 years from now would have been uh, another story. So as David said in the, in the previous seminar, we really need to analyze and fully use the potential of this new observation. And so in that sense, our data set opens many new perspectives, such as the refinement of glacial basins. For example, I show again the penny ice cap here, uh, which, which basins could be uh, uh, refined. Uh, we could calculate uh, er erosion rates, uh, calibrate the ice dynamic in glacial model and even open the doors to more complex uh, ice thickness uh, inversions. So thank you for your attention and um, uh, you are welcome uh, if you have any questions. Fantastic, thank you very much for uh, your um, seminar tonight and uh, the explanation of what an incredible data set um, we already have one question on the chat. Um, Trevor, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? Okay, uh, thank you, Tavi. Um, yes, I, I think it's an amazing data set, and presumably using GPR, you could detect the difference between cold ice and warm ice. And I'm very interested to know what is the maximum thickness of cold ice uh, that you have observed in the in the database. Um, so it's so I, I'm not, I, we, I didn't do this analysis specifically to to detect. Uh, so I, I don't really know where is the uh, if if there is existing maps of cold and and, and warm ice, but the the one of the thickest uh, thicknesses that we, we have seen are located in, in, in Patagonia, for example, with, um, uh, with the Viedma glaciers, where you have uh, thicknesses uh, that are uh, 1,300 meters. Uh, yes, so I, I don't, that may not, but that may not uh, um, reply to, to, your quest, to your questions. Okay, well, well, thanks. I, mean, I, I just guess that um, perhaps you could use this method to to tell us about how the the, um, the cold ice and warm ice boundary does vary across glaciers across the planet. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you mean uh, you mean with the with the creep parameter with the for example. With the calculation of this creep parameter. Well, I'm not sure how you would do it, but uh, yeah, yeah, that would that would be. I uh, just suspect you have the method now to be able to do yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's something that 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 we we would need to to explore. Yeah, as I said, this opens the door to many to many applications. So we have a project now uh, to calculate. Uh, I, this is on a complete uh, on a different subject, but to calculate er erosion rates, uh, we also have yeah. some co collaboration to uh, use the ice flow to re-estimate uh, surface ma uh, the surface mass balance. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, sounds fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Paco. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah. Hello. Uh, well, it was nice talk. Was it's really a tremendous amount of work. Of course, a big step forward. But I'm particularly uh, particularly concerned or worried about one one aspect, or maybe a few related ones, mm -hmm. uh, but all related to the same thing. Is the fact that you have used only this 2017-18 uh, uh, data? when we know that there are large interannual variations of uh, in surface velocity, especially for sea terminating, for tight water glaciers. Mm -hmm. So uh, the fact that you are using data from one year or the other 
can imply really huge um, differences in the velocity. Even yes. you have your thickness inversion, which is based on uh, velocity data. Mm -hmm. That means that if all other uh, data, for instance, uh, surfaces, slope, and so on, do not change, but you have big changes in uh, mm -hmm. uh, interannual velocity, yes. uh, then you will have, of course, uh, variations in AI thickness, which can be uh, quite large. And then yes. also related to this, uh, I will just give just three comments and then you can answer. Yes. Then also the fact that you calibrate the A factor, and also you have this uh, beta parameter uh, in the flow law using the observed thickness, probably this observed thickness will come from a different year. So you will be calibrating the rate factor that you are using for the inversion using data from a different setting. And then all of these things together make me feel worried about the, the results. Or I mean, a huge effort has to be done with the error analysis to include the, what would be the influence of the interannual variations of mm -hmm. surface velocity. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for, for this uh, question. So yeah, yes, you are right that a large interannual variation in surface velocity will impact the result on the on the ice thickness. So we use uh, so for so we use the two years of data and we uh, we make an average uh, mosaic of the velocity over these two years. So we suppose that the variations during these two years should be. Uh, should the, the interannual variation should should become a, a little bit compensated, but of course, if you have a glacier that has been ac uh, accelerating uh, for several years, this will of course impact the ice velocity. Uh, so this is what we try to to do, and we try to mitigate our error budget by accounting for surges, for example. But uh, uh, you are right; this is very difficult. Maybe with the amount of the the increasing amount of observation, this, this, will, this will help. And concerning the A factor, yes, we, so you are right also, we calibrate with in, in situ thickness data. Those data, most of the time, uh, for a lot of them, we don't have years. So we just take whatever we can to calibrate the, the data. So of course, it would, it would be the best if we have precisely time tag uh, thickness data, but this is not the case. And if we remove the data that don't have date, then there will be almost no, very few glacier cover. And yeah, this is a, a big problem also. Yeah, you have the time change in velocity. You have the DEM that are not exactly time tagged at the same uh, time as the ice velocity, and then you have a mismatch, temporal mismatch with the in situ ice thickness data. So yeah, the, this product is far from, from being perfect. So we just hope that this will, this new data set will just open new doors and uh, bring people to use it and explore it and do even do some even more complex inversions of thicknesses. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Felix, um, do you want to ask your question? Hi, hi, Roman. Can, can you hi. hear me? Yes. Hi, thanks for this uh, really interesting talk. Uh, really enjoyed that. My Thank you. question is related to Paco's question about the, the A and the beta. Mm -hmm. um, I, I took it that you explained the calibration of A uh, mm -hmm. and then the estimation of beta kind of in order in a talk. But mm -hmm. in, reality, uh, in reality, are you estimating them both together or is there a particular uh, yeah, order yeah. where you are just calibrating for A in areas that are not sliding and then, uh, and then um, trying to seek out the function of uh, uh, parameterization for beta? Thank you. Thanks for your question. So yeah, it was not uh, presented in order, but first we calculate the beta map using the surface velocity and the, and the slope. When we, once we have this uh, uh, beta map, we uh, calibrate uh, the, uh, the creep parameter. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you. Uh, Forrest. Yeah, hey, um, awesome talk. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the 
Bird Polar and Climate Research Center. Um, I was super excited and interested when I saw your paper come out a couple of years ago on the, the ice velocity, um, particularly um, in the Cordillera Blanca, where we at the, uh, at the Bird Center have been working on calibrating a series of ice thickness and flow models uh, that we've specifically adapted for the tropics using, um, you could call it extensive in situ data uh, that we've collected over the past couple decades. Um, and that, okay. that includes um, like GNSS, GPR surveys, and ice cores to bedrock in the accumulation zone. Um, we've, we've been having a hard time uh, pa parameterizing some of these, um, like I guess working with some of these specific parameters that other folks have brought up in the, in the Q&A here um, that you mentioned in the, in the chat. And um, I mean, even with a lot of the, these in situ data, um, I guess I'm just curious, uh, maybe I missed this in your chat, but um, I saw that you said the data will soon be available. Um, I was curious if you could um, say anything more about that. I'm, we're, we're very much looking forward to comparing some of our um, mm -hmm. our measures. Okay. And, uh, yeah, anyway, just really curious about that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah thanks for your question. So uh, at this time, the glaciers, in the, the paper, we have a paper in, uh, in the third round of revision. So we, we hope it will be out soon. And once the paper is out, uh, the the data will be published on this uh, on this portal, the the Teia portal, which is the same as the data set from uh, Romain Gonet. So we hope that this will be in the coming months. But, uh, but the the review process has lasted for uh, uh, quite quite a long time, so we, we never know. But we hope it will be within the months. May, may I ask, just as a follow up, what about the um the data used to produce the graphics and the remote sensing uh, paper from yes, th those those data are available. You 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 can write to me and I will I will send them to you. Awesome! Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, um, Andre. Do you want to unmute yourself uh, and ask a question, or is it? Uh, should I read it out? You've typed. So I I can read it. Uh, so. Hi Romain, have you a chance to compare your velocity data with the recently retired velocity data set based on Sentinel-1 from 2014? So is this the, this is the paper by uh, Matthias Braun? I, maybe? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, we, um, so I didn't do uh, a, a specific comparison of this data set. We just looked regionally uh, through the data portal. So we have some really similar um, uh, features for large glaciers, for, uh, I, uh, for ice caps and ice fields. But for, um, so they use a, a, a large sampling resolution. I think it's 120 or more meters for the cross correlation. So when they, for the for small valley glaciers, uh, there is uh, a bit of limitations in the in the Sentinel One uh, data product. But of course, they have a much larger time series uh, than, than we do uh, at the time. But in, in terms of resolution for small glaciers, I, I think that their data set is a bit comparable to the its live its live product. Thank you. Trevor. Okay, uh, thanks again. Um, about 10 days ago, I was in Scotland uh, at Fort William with the QRA um, field meeting, mainly looking at the Lake Glacial and Younger Dry uh, glaciers in that area. Uh, Doug Ben was on the trip and he was talking about surging glaciers. Mm -hmm. um, and as well as those in, in the Fort William area, I think he's looked at it more globally as well, and he's identified an, an area of latitude where you're more likely to get these surging glaciers. Okay. I think he said that they occur when you have a rather uh, shallow slope on the glacier surface. So I think it'd be quite interesting for you to, to read okay. the paper, which is in the Scottish Geographical Journal, okay. number 137, 
okay. 2021. Okay. See how that compares with what you're saying about surging glasses from your results. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you for the recommendation. So those surge, this paper is surge, surge, surging glaciers for a specific uh, time period, or it, it's just like an inventory? It's an um, inventory. Well, he was certainly talking about the, the younger dryers. Okay. 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 But, okay. but I think I think his thoughts go much wider than that. Okay, great. So I, I, I just suggest you you read yes. this and see how it compares with what you're finding, perhaps more theoretically. I mean, his okay. work is is very empirical. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you for the. Thank you for this. While we ask for any last questions on the chat, I'll just ask a question if that's okay. Yes. Um, I was interested whether you can use any kind of sensitivity analysis to identify either particular glaciers or particular regions that are really important to do field measurements on to, to validate this kind of thing. Yeah, so we did this, um, so we didn't do a proper sensitivity measurements, but for the case of the Himalaya, we have such a large region with so few in situ measurements. And really the way you are going to calibrate uh, the, to calculate this A parameter is going to have uh, enormous influence on the results of the ice thickness. For example, if you use all the data in the Himalayas, you use the average uh, A value over the entire Himalaya, it's gonna be completely different as if you will do things locally, and uh, 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 which is what we did here in this, um, in this paper. So we, we know that um, when, when you don't have much in situ thickness measurements, uh, the way you calibrate the A will have a, a really important impact on the results. Thank you very much. I think we've probably run out of questions now. I don't see anything new on the chat other than thanks for a really great talk. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, for a really inspirational talk and uh, point out uh, next week's seminar where we have three early career scientists talking on their research, so three shorter talks. So um, I hope to see many of you again next week and thank you very much indeed again, yes. Roman. Thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Bye-bye. So. <laughs> thank you and Good night and good day to everyone.